Hello. Welcome to stage Milliways. Uh, today, the, the, here are Endspace and Sign Pencils from team organizers. And they just... They just came back from DEF CON and uh, you'll hear a talk about attack and defense uh, capture the flag. Have fun. Hey, yeah, perfect. So, hello everyone. Um, we're going to give a talk uh, about Capture the Flag. So, who here has played a Capture the Flag competition at least once? Okay, quite a few, quite a few. So, who of you has ever played Attack and Defense CTF? Oh, still quite a lot of people. So, who of you have ever been confused or lost the first time they played an Attack and Defense CTF? <laughs> Okay, so still quite a few people. Okay, so basically this talk is for, is for you, for these people. So um, we play CTF with organizers. Um, we have been playing CTF together for a few years now, since about 2020. I've been playing longer than that before with like different teams. And uh, we got like yes, last year we got first place in the world ranking. And when we started out, we were really terrible at attack and defense. Uh, over the years, we got like less terrible, and we learned a lot of things. Uh, we have been playing for some time now. So, what we wanted to do in this talk is to give you about a short introduction to what AAD CTF is for everyone else in the audience who hasn't played. Uh, we will show you how we play attack and defense in CTF, and overall, we would like to give you an idea of what we would have liked to know when we started with attack and defense. And then at the end, there's going to be some fun stories. So let's get started. Uh, so first of all, uh, for those of you who have no idea about attack and defense, this is a bit of a short introduction. So what is this? And CTF in general. So a CTF is, stands for Capture the Flag, and it's a hacking competition. The goal of the competition is to uh, basically hack computers which are set up on purpose with vulnerable software, and steal some secret data from these computers. Uh, and the secret data that you have to steal is called a flag. And um, which is th this is where the name of the competition comes from. It's capture the flag because you have to hack a computer, steal the flag. Um, and a flag is basically something like this. It's um, some data. Uh, usually it has some recognizable format. For example, in this case, there's some prefix that lets you identify this as a flag, and then the rest can be anything. Like sometimes it's random data. Sometimes it's like somebody put something meaningful in there. But the important thing is that it has this like identifiable thing that lets you, as well as machines, figure out that this is a flag and not something else. Now, um, there are two types of CTF, Jeopardy CTF and Attack and Defense CTF. Uh, so Jeopardy is by far the most common type, and this is what most people will, have, will be familiar with if they play CTF at least once. We have a Jeopardy CTF going on right now at the camp, so if you're interested, you should go play. Uh, attack oh, it's over. Oh, never mind. Too late, sorry. Uh, but um, And then uh, in Jeopardy CTF, the way it works is that uh, the, the team that organizes the CTF sets up the computers that, uh, that run the vulnerable software, and then every team attacks the same computers, and everyone has to capture the same flags. So it's like kind of, um, yeah, everyone competes against everyone, but like they don't hack each other. And uh, each, each challenge in a Jeopardy CTF is worth some number of points, and then once the challenge is solved, you get the points, and at the end, uh, the team that has the most points wins. So it's pretty easy. So you solve the challenge, you're done with the challenge, you move on to something else. Uh, attack and defense, on the other hand, is pretty different. Uh, this is the type of, the CTA, of, of CTF that this talk will focus on. And um, in this case, rather than everyone attacking the same computers, everyone is trying to attack everyone else. So uh, it's like um, a lot different. Uh, unfortunately, they're also a lot less common because um, Playing an attack and defense CTF is much more confusing, much more difficult, requires much more preparation, but also organizing an attack and defense CTF requires much more preparation. So because then you have, you don't just have like, you know, a bunch of service, services running on some computer, you actually have to set up a network connecting all the players, and every player has to have their vulnerable machine, and it's like a ton more setup, and it's like a lot harder. So um, the setup is that uh, every team will have their own machine called a vuln box, so vulner vulnerable box, vuln box for short, uh, where 
all of these services run, and every team can talk to every other team's vuln box. And the flags are on uh, the team's vuln box. And the idea is that, as a team, you should like find bugs in the services that run on every, uh, every one of the vuln box. Everyone runs the same. And hack them, and then steal the other team's flags. And at the same time, prevent the other teams from stealing your flags. So it's like, yeah, you, you're directly uh, attacking other teams, and other teams are attacking you, and you're like trying to you're sort of do incident response in real time while at the same trying to hack everyone else. So um, the way this is set up normally is that uh, every vuln box has a number of services, like so programs running on this machine, and uh, every one of these services communicates with the game network uh, over UDP or TCP so that other teams can interact with you. And then uh, every service has its own set of flags, like uh, we saw before what the flag is. Uh, in this case, every service has distinct flags that uh, you have to steal by attacking that service. And the interactions with the services typically works uh, in a way similar to this. Um, so the service lets you a client create uh, create some kind of account or like in some way store some kind of secret data in this case we see that this is could be like a web service that lets you post things, like in a blog, I don't know. And um, in the client is creating a secret post that only they can see. Uh, and the content is some secret. And then the, only the client is allowed to see the secret. If somebody else tries to access it, they will get like some permission denied. Um, permission denied error. So uh, the goal of the CTF, of course, is like the there are bugs in the services, so every service has some bug. I don't know, like SQL injection or like buffer overflow, whatever. Like, can be really anything. And so the goal uh, of all of the teams is to find these bugs and then exploit them to get the other team's flags from their vuln boxes. So in practice, it could look something like this. So say that our blog service has some kind of SQL injection, and you submit the SQL injection payload, and you use it to get out all of the posts, including the secret ones. And so you steal the team's flags. OK, so this is like kind of the high-level overview. and. Um, uh, so the goals that we've established uh, for you as a team are as follows. So first of all, you have to steal the other team's flags. Pretty clear, right? You just exploit the bugs and then steal the flags. Number two, you have to defend your own flags. Uh, so uh, you ha there are bugs, and you have to prevent the other teams from exploiting these bugs and stealing your flag somehow. Now, you might be wondering, OK, well, um, since we, we said that you have, every team has the box, Vuln box, and by the way, the teams have full, usually have full access to the Vuln box so that they have like ro root on it and everything, so can't they the teams just like, you know, shut down everything and then nobody gets hacked? Well, I mean, yes. Uh, the thing is that if everyone did this and if it was allowed, then this would make for a very uninteresting challenge because simply everyone takes their services offline and nobody, nobody has anything to attack, no, stack, no flex to seal, no fun. And of course, this is obviously like not possible, so um, what most CTF in practice too is that they are the third goal. Third goal is that you have to keep your services running and functional, and this is called like the SLA goal because uh, it's uh, supposed to resemble, I guess, like in the real world where you're running some service and somebody's paying you for the service. You have an SLA, which means that if you the service is down, you get penalized for it. And this is the same in the uh, defense CTF. So uh, on top of stealing uh, flags and defending your own flags, you also have to make sure that the services that like, the vulnerable services keep working as intended. And that doesn't mean that they have to also keep work like the bugs have to keep working. Just the service, in the, like for example, going back to our previous example, uh, um, you have to have, like, if somebody submits a f uh, some secret data and a secret post, they have to be able to get it back. So, um, if you, for example, patch the service so that like the la last request doesn't actually return a flag, it just returns an empty response, then this would be normally be an SLA violation because you, yes, you made it impossible to steal the flag, but also you made it like you made the service not work anymore. So this is like you get penalized for this. And so the checker is a system that is part of the CTF infrastructure that enforces this rule. So it's a bot that will regularly connect to every service on every team's vuln box and test that it still works properly. So uh, in this case, like you see that the checker is you know, creating an account, creating a secret post that contains a flag, and then try to read the flag back. And if the, it re actually receives the flag, then it means that the service is working. And if it's not, then the service is not working, and the team is going to get penalized. Uh, so um, the other thing, the, the checker also does something else that is really, really important for the game, which is that, as you can see here, actually, it uploads flags to the, um, to the vuln boxes. So at the start of the game, the vuln boxes don't actually contain any flags. Uh, the vuln box, the flags are added periodically by the checker when it connects the, to the challenges and tests them. So it does like both things at once, both test that the challenge works and, makes, and uploads the new flags uh, like that. 
So um, yeah, and the thing is that uh, unlike so the main difference in this case is that unlike in Jeopardy, where the, there's one flag per challenge, and once you solve this challenge, like the the flag is gone and you just move on to something else. In A and D, uh, you typically have to keep exploiting the service, every service, over and over and over, so that every time that the checker uploads a new flag to, to some other team, you steal that flag. So it's like a bit different. You just have to keep working on the challenges throughout the match. Uh, and then, of course, like you might ask yourself, well, okay, I have this game network, and I don't know. Suppose that I am team one, and uh, like, and the checker has this like IP that only the checker uses, and how can I, can I not just like set up a firewall rule that just drops every connection except the connections from the server, well, that's from the checker? Well, obviously, I mean, if you could do that, it will also be like really uninteresting because then every, nobody can attack anymore. So uh, the way that this is solved is that uh, the game network has a router that. Um, where that every team's all of the traffic sent by the other teams goes through, and uh, the, this router does source not. So when you receive traffic from the game network, uh, it looks like all the connections are coming from the IP address of the router. So that in practice, unless you can somehow like fingerprint the checker by looking at I don't know the user agent or some other stuff, uh, you're not supposed to be able to tell uh, that a connection comes from the checker versus from another team. So so yeah, this is basically like uh, this is kind of the setup. All right, so this was like a bit of an introduction. Now, uh, suppose we are imagine that you're playing an attack and defense CTF. The CTF starts, and now what do you do? Well, OK, first few things to keep in mind. Time. Time is thing number one in attack and defense CTF. It's very hectic. And unlike in Jeopardy, like in Jeopardy, if you solve a challenge right at the start of the CTF, or if you solve it at the end of the CTF, it really doesn't matter that much. Because uh, at the end of the day, you always get the same number of points. It doesn't matter if you solve, like if you get first blood or not. Like some Jeopardy CTFs do have first blood bonuses, but it's kind of frowned upon because uh, it really doesn't, like it's really bad if it happens when you know your team is asleep because uh, it, like, and some other team is awake because in a different time zone. So in practice, nobody really does that. Uh, and so in Jeopardy, it doesn't matter if you're like too fast or too slow. As long as you solve something, it's good. Uh, on the other hand, in attack and defense, the first team that solves the challenge uh, typically has a big advantage over everybody else. Well, because and that's mainly for two reasons. Well, first of all, that you're su essentially surprising everyone because if you're really fast at finding a bug and exploiting it, uh, there's a good chance that none of the other teams have found the same bug that you did, and so they're unaware of it. They haven't patched, so you just like exploit everyone, get everyone's flag, and then you keep doing so for the entire game. Like many, mm, often it just happens that some teams like just never patch a certain bug, so if you keep just keep farming them throughout the game for points, and it's, it's pretty good. Uh, so, um, and again, if you patch quickly, you're also going to prevent, you're going to get a lot more defense points because you're going to get uh, prevent all the other teams that are exploiting from stealing your flags. So the faster teams to exploit the bug and to patch the bug typically is the team that wins. Uh, and so, like again, keep in mind, time is king, be fast as fast as you can. And importantly, uh, often attack and defense services are, um, they, they typically have some low hanging fruits. Like usually there's at least one bug, if, mm, if often even more than one bug in each attack and defense service. And many of them are like, pretty easy to find. Like, for example, if you see that there's, I don't know, a service that has a SQL, like a web service that has a MySQL database as backend, like you should immediately start looking for, you know, like trivial SQL injection where they like concatenate the strings or like it, maybe you should try to see if the, the database server has some default password or things like that. So like my advice is like immediately start looking for lo the low hanging fruits because uh, this is going to pay off. And then the other thing that is really, really important is collaboration. So CTF in general is a team sport, but I think A and D is even more of a team sport than Jeopardy. So the thing is that in Jeopardy, in a Jeopardy CTF, it will have 20 plus or maybe even 30 plus challenges, and then uh, you might have like one, two, maybe three people working on uh, the same challenge, and everyone like kind of work independently, and they work in isolation. In A and D, on the other hand, you will have may many fewer services, maybe like five, six, like not that many, and so for a team of the same size, you will have uh, many more people working on the same service, and uh, you will have things happening all the time because you don't just have to work on exploiting the service. Like in Jeopardy, you also have to check if anyone is exploiting you. Uh, try to steal their exploits. Make sure that your patch has worked. Like you try to patch the service, but also make sure that your patch worked and you're you're not losing SLA points. And maybe somebody founds a DOS and like brings your service down by like exploiting I don't know crashing your service, and then you lose the SLA points. So you have to patch that as well. And so it's like. 
many, 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 many things going on at once, and it's really, really important that uh, you communicate what you're doing to the rest of your team. So uh, you will have many more people working on a single service, and it's important that if somebody just like you know um, uh, just joins the CTF late, they don't have to uh, have somebody explain the service to them and like take this person away from the service. So uh, my advice is write down everything, 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 everything you find about the service, anything that you've done, like all of the patches that you wrote, try to write everything down. So you can use uh, you can just like use a chat, uh, like chat, like IRC or Discord. Like we, we use Discord a lot, and it kind of works for us. But we also use uh, de dedicated tools for this, uh, like CTF Note. So CTF Note is an open source tool that uh, lets you is specifically designed to share notes during a CTF. It lets you like create a task, and then you can have markdown notes uh, on about the task, like using hack and D or something like that. And we use that as well. It works pretty well. Like, but yeah, you can use whatever tools you want. The important thing is that everything is written down and is communicated to the entire team, because it's also really important. So what do you get at the start of the CTF? So you will get access to the game network, which means you can connect to the network. Typically, it's going to be through a VPN. Or if you're playing an on-site CTF, you're going to actually get like an actual Ethernet cable that lets you connect to the VPN. You will get the, the Vuln box, uh, and you get typically get root access on the Vuln box. Not all CTFs do this, but typically you do. And uh, you'll have some way to submit the, the flags you steal from the other teams. And this is like typically some API where you can submit the flags. And then if you submit a, an actual flag and not just something fake, you'll get points. Um, so try to figure out at first what are you even running. Because uh, in Jeopardy, you, if you ever play a Jeopardy CTF, there's typically some files you can download. And then you look at the files and you kind of know like, what you're doing. On A&D, no. You just get like the phone box. You might, there might be like a list of the names of the services. But you don't know like, what is running. You don't know what ports uh, or protocols the services use. Like it could be TCP, UDP, HTTP, like some text-based protocol, TLS. You just don't know. You have to find out. And uh, so try to figure out what ports and protocols the services use. You need to figure out where the code is, where the binary is for each service, so that you can patch it, or you can like look at the code and try to figure out what it's doing. And then you need to try to eventually. You also need to try to figure out what the services do, so that you can you know try to start find bugs, exploit the bugs, fix the bugs. Okay, so this is a lot of things, and like not all of these things are easy. Like if you want, just want to see, I don't know, what ports, uh, what ports are open on the phone box, you can just use something like uh, netstat or uh, ss, something like this. But then, um, like for example, what do the services do? Like this is kind of hard to figure out sometimes. So um, an important part of playing AND is to have the right tools. And so we're gonna, now we're going to talk a bit more uh, about what tools we use, what the ones we think are important, and what they do for us. And uh, we can yeah, give you some advice on like, what tools you should try to prepare for an AND. So the first thing, like most important thing, the like single most important thing that you should have, like if you are not going to have any other tooling, please have this, is some kind of uh, traffic analysis setup. Now, this doesn't have to be very complicated. Like, the simplest thing you can do is to simply run TCP dump on your Vuln box and dump all TCP and UDP traffic in some pickup files and then open it in Wireshark. Now, this is like really easy. It's also not that great because uh, so Wireshark is uh, not really meant to give you an overview of, I don't know, like, I mean, yes, it can show you an HTTP session and show you that, yeah, this thing made this client made a request, but it's also like really low level. It, show, it will show you a lot of noise that is not really needed. Like, for example, uh, that there was a TCP packet, and like this is the size of the TCP window and all of these things. And I mean, this is not really very useful for attack and defense. It also doesn't really support having opening multiple pickups at once. And if you run TCP dump in a loop, you're typically only save like, I don't know, one pickup a minute and then generate a new file. And then also, there is no way to generate interaction scripts, uh, which basically means it, there's no way once given a, a um, a pickup that contains some client interacting with one of your services, there is no way to automatically generate a script, like a Python script, that uh, replicates this interaction between the two services, which is really, really useful if you're trying to attack somebody else, like just to have some ba a basic interaction script. So Wireshark can work. Not great, though. Uh, so what we would like from a, our ideal traffic analysis tools is something that will show you traffic by service, ideally run request at a time. As we saw before, um, ID and CTF, uh, CTF services are typically like they request based to some extent. Like uh, in the previous example, we had a web service, but it could also be like a text-based interface where you just tell the service, do this thing, and then the service replies. So you would like to see one request at a time. You'll be able, you sh want to be able to search the traffic for patterns like uh 
we saw at the beginning of the presentation that flags usually have some kind of recognizable format that tells you that this is a flag. And one of the things that you will do very often is to try to search for your traffic uh, for requests containing the flags. For example, uh, if you see that there is a connection where somebody uh, you know, doesn't submit any flags but then receives a flag, this is likely somebody exploiting you, right? So uh, you want to be able to spot these connections quickly. And then the other thing is it lets you replicate exploits quickly. So if you see somebody attacking you, uh, you uh, ideally, like this tool should have some button that gives you a Python script that replicates the exploit that just attacked you so that you can use it against other teams. So, uh, this is like the tools, the traffic analysis tools that we tried. There's a few. Uh, so, the first one we tried is Archimy, which is, I think, was, used to be called Moloch. Now they changed the name to Archimy. This is not really designed for specifically for CTF, it's more of a general traffic analysis tool that is meant for, like, I don't know, uh, threat detection, things like that. It can work, uh, but I think it's also not that great because, uh, for example, it has no way to, to do. Um, to the replication, like has a bunch, like you need to run Elasticsearch, which is kind of annoying to do, uh, and so on. Um, and then, so you can use it. I just wouldn't like recommend it. We it didn't work very well for us. And then the others are Pikapa 2, uh, which is um, written specifically for attack and defense CTFs, works pretty well. And then Flower and Tulip. So Flower uh, was written, I think, many years ago by. Uh, like another team, and then Tulip is a fork of flour made by like the, some of our teammates, uh, who, some of which are in the audience. So thank you. <laughs> they they uh, forked uh, flour and a lot added a lot of improvements, and then uh, they used it for uh, when they were playing in the ICC, the International Cyber Security Competition. And we decided to well that we should use this as well. It's open source; like anyone can take it and use it. And we think this is like this is the kind of the standard tool that we're using nowadays. It works pretty well. So here is like some screenshots of the things that I talked about before. Like in Tulip, uh, you can see on the top there's like a, the, the thing where it says trademark. That's uh, a drop-down menu that lets you select the service. Uh, you can see on the left that there's a list of requests that were made to a service. Some of them, uh, some of them are tagged as flag out or um, or enemy. Uh, and these are tags you can assign, like you can uh, add rules so that it will auto tag your traffic. For example, with flag out, it means that uh, this like somebody attacked you and like a flag came out, or maybe the checker requested a flag. So you can like do all this like advanced searching, and then on the right side you uh, can see the data contained in the request. In this case, we can you can see the HTTP. And a uh, very good feature of Tulip is that it lets you replicate exploits really easily. So uh, in this case, you can see this like this is the HTTP request from the previous slide. You can see it just like you know HTTP. If you open, if you click on Python on the Python request view, it will show you give you the Python code that will um, basically make the same request. Now, this sounds like you, know, you could write this code by hand, of course. But as we said in, at the beginning of the talk, time is king. So you don't want to waste time writing the same thing by hand. So having this and being able to get a, a Python script that replicates uh, your, like, some, what traffic somebody sent you automatically is really good. Uh, and this doesn't only work for HTTP. It also works for text-based things. Like, so in this case, you can see that this uh, service is like, just a text interface over TCP. And uh, there's a button called Copy as Pwn Tools. So for those of you who don't know or who have not played CTF, Pwn Tools is a Python library that basically every uh, CTF team should know and use. A and it has many, many functions. But in this case, what matters is that it has functions to let you uh, communicate with uh, remote services over TCP, over this text-based interface. It's kind of like the standard, like everyone uses this. And being able to copy text-based traffic as pawn tools is really useful because you can then like, do the same, use this as a basis for your next plate. OK, so like, this is it for traffic analysis. Like, use Tulip. It's open source. If you want to send, like, send some feature requests, I think uh, we'll be <laughs> more than more than, like, the authors will be more than happy to, to take them. And yeah, so that's one thing. Other thing is that, of course, you have to get yourself connected to the game network. So you might have uh, you know, like services you want to be on the game network, and also your players probably also want to be on the game network. And uh, so the thing is that um, I highly, what I highly recommend doing is to run your own VPN server and then connect that server to the game network, and then route everyone's traffic through your game server. Now, why should you do this? Well, first of all, if a CTF is on site, often what you get is just one Ethernet cable, one Ethernet cable for the entire team. And so uh, if you have 
if the CTF uh, allows remote players, you want those players to be able to connect to the game network, uh, even though you and they, they cannot possibly do so directly. So you have to set up a VPN server for them. But even in online CTFs, where you do get VPN configs that everyone can use, you often get a limited amount of VPN configs, like a lim limited amount of VPN credentials. So, uh, and y in my experience, like uh, if you have few enough players, you can try to share those between players, but it always ends up in like re being really messy because you have to make sure that no two people use the same configura wireguard configuration and, and so on. And so I just recommend not doing that and instead having your own VPN server. That way it just like become, everything becomes a lot easier. So um, set up your own VPN server. Uh, now, okay, suppose that you have you know, looked at the service, you reversed it, you find, you find a bug, you rate an exploit, and these exploits can get flags. Now what? Well, first of all, some things about flags is that uh, the, as an attack and defense CTF runs in ticks. And a tick is a time, time interval of one to five minutes. Every tick, the checker will upload new flags. And then after a few ticks that have been uploaded, these flags will expire. They will not be considered valid anymore. So if you steal a flag that is too old, it just wasted effort. So uh, what you have to do is that, you, first of all, you, uh, you don't only want to run this against one team. You want to run your exploit against every single team in the CTF. As we said before, there will be some teams that never patch. There will be some teams that just like, I mean, they either cannot be bothered or they just don't have enough time to patch everything. So um, like in every single CTF I played, there was always somebody who had like, who, there was never a time where everyone had patched against some exploit, except uh, un unless it was like very late in the CTF. So always run everything against everyone, unless you really know that everyone has patched. But even then, somebody sometimes people revert their patches by accident. So never say never. Uh, and um, if you're early, you'll take uh, all, all the teams by surprise, and they will not have patched. So you will get a lot of flags. Even if you're not early, again, people don't patch. So just like keep running your exploit. And you don't also don't want to run the exploit only once. As we said before, flags get reintroduced all the time. So you should run it over and over and over and over again, like every, every tick, ideally. And uh, oh, this is like already starting to be like quite a lot of code, like you know, keeping track of which teams exist and like connecting to a team and then rerunning the exploit. And this can be like quite a lot of boilerplate. So uh, you don't really, really don't want to have to re-implement this every time you write an exploit. So you should have some kind of framework uh, or tool that, let, that does this automatically for you, and we'll show you what we use later. So, but I mean, keep this in mind. Um, also, another consideration is that sometimes exploits, uh, so you have, if, if you have a CTF with 100 teams, which can happen sometimes, you will have 100 instances of every exploit. So this can add up to quite some resources, except if the exploit is like CPU intensive or RAM intensive. So you probably also want to have some machines that you just use to run the exploits. And then also you have to submit these flags. So as I said before, uh, the CTF gives you some kind of API that lets you submit the flag that you've stolen from a different team. So also you will also need to implement the submission protocol in your exploit. Like, uh, and usually it needs some kind of authentication, and then you need to make the request in a specific format, and then it will tell you if the flag was like valid or not valid. And again, you don't really do want to waste time doing this every time you write this thing exploit. So how do we do it? Well, we basically use a tool called Destructive Farm. So this is a open source tool that we didn't make, like somebody else made it and put it on GitHub, and we just like um, saw it on GitHub when we started using it. A, um, we have our own fork of this, like our own private fork with some improvements, which we call Destructive Ranch. But like I would say that the core functionality is like mostly the same. Uh, so the way this works is that uh, you write your exploit as a Python script that takes the IP address of the team and then has to print, the, like it does stuff, and run, farm doesn't really care. All it, all it has to do is take a, the IP on the command line and then print print flags, and then uh, on, st on std out. And then you will run the exploit using a, cli a farm client, which will like automatically respawn your exploit every every time there's a new tick. It will like automatically spawn one instance of the exploit per team. It will like kill it if it takes too long. It will like do all of this for you. You just have to like basically print the flags. And then when the client sees that your exploit has printed a flag, it will submit it to the destructive farm to destructive farm or ranch server, which collects all of the flags from your team. You can have like exploits running on as many machines as you want. Like they can be on a teammate's laptop. They can be on like VPS somewhere that has a lot of cores. It can be whatever. As long as they can connect to your to the server, it will like submit the flags there, and then the fl the server will implement the game submission API. So basically, like this kind of abstraction layer between your exploit and the flag submission. So it will if the and it will also do things like if the for some reason the flag submission server doesn't work, it will like retry to submit later and like it does all of these things for you. It works pretty well. 
Um, yeah, so again, advantages of, of doing it like this is that you don't have to re-implement uh, the retries and resubmission and like running against every team and every exploit. And you ha can run the exploits anywhere you want. It doesn't have to be on like some server. You can just like run it whatever. Uh, some customization we added to this is that uh, we uh, added some dedicated machines that uh, we only use to run exploits. We call these the exploit farms. And we added some features to the web UI that lets you simply upload an exploit as a Python file. And then this gets scheduled on one of, on one of the farms of your choosing and then simply runs it like for the rest of the CTF. Uh, so the advantage of doing this uh, as opposed to uh, running your exploit on your own laptop is that, well, first of all, if you like f fall asleep on your desk and your laptop like dies because it ran out of battery, the exploit will not start running. That's if somebody opens the web UI, they can see a list of all of the exploits that are running there. And then third, that if your exploit uses a lot of resources, we can schedule it on a machine that has a lot of CPU, a lot of RAM, uh, and not like make your like, you know, laptop die because you had too many Chrome tabs open as, as well as the exploit. Uh, we also have some monitoring, like you can see here, like, I don't know, this is how many flags will be submitted every tick and so on. And yeah, and yeah um, also, you, we already introduced like, quite a lot of infrastructure, like you know, farm and like, the, the, um, the exploit servers and the VPN server and all of these things, like Tulip, whatever, exploits. Uh, so you probably don't want to like, lose time at the beginning of the CTF by setting up all of these things by hand. Like If it's just one service, it's OK. But when it starts being four services that have to be up, it's quite a lot of work. And again, time is king, so you, you need to automate this. And what we use to automate this is Terraform and Ansible. So Terraform is basically something that uh, calls a cloud provider's API to um, create VMs, create uh, private networks, uh, create everything. And um, which is very useful for just like creating your infra in the cloud. And then Ansible is a tool that then configures the servers for you. So Ansible basically, uh, it's a tool that lets you run arbitrary commands on any service that you can SSH, or any server that you, NSSH, that you can SSH into. So you say, you say, I want you to do this and this and this on this server, on this server, or this many servers, and this will like go and SSH to the servers and do it for you. Like the reason why we chose to do Ansible is that like there are many alternatives to it, but the reason why we like it so much is that uh, first of all, it works with anything that supports SSH. It doesn't matter if it's a cloud VM, physical machine, like anything. And it's pretty flexible, and it also works really well with uh, on-site CTFs, where we have like actual physical machines, and uh, we cannot rely on like a cloud provider to run the scripts for us. And yeah, and then also you can have some monitoring. I think this is not like super critical, but it can be nice. Monitor your infra, monitor the start of the game, and we use Grafana for this because it basically supports showing anything that is in a database, and it's pretty good. We the camp has a Grafana dashboard, which I think is really cool. But yeah, we use the same as well. Okay, so uh, now we talked about the tools. We talked about how CTF works. I will give uh, Luca the stage so that he can talk a bit about A and D tactics. So, go Luca. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. So, okay, now uh, you know how to basically play AD. Uh, let's talk about now how do you win AD, right? What are the strategies uh, that you should uh, implement? Uh, we'll go through them in order of priority. Um, some of them are fair to other teams, some of them are not. Um, let's get into it. So, uh, what should you spend time on? First of all, uh, the most important thing is look at traffic. Use your traffic analyzer, right? This is the most important tool in your arsenal to understand what is going on. Again, AD is very hectic, it's very messy, there are a lot of services. Looking at traffic is, gives you the status of the game, right? Um, not only you can uh, detect when you're getting exploited and you look at uh, what are the attacker is doing against your service, but you can actually understand how a service works. Just, for example, looking at the checker, what he's doing, right? Instead of looking at the source of a service, sometimes it's much faster to look at, okay, what requests does the checker do? Like, what is the login flow, what actions can it do, and so on and so on. Directly related to look at traffic, uh, the one of the most important things vital to winning is uh, the following, stealing exploits, right? Uh, as, uh, a very famous <laughs> as a very famous painter once said, uh, good hackers get inspired, but the ones who win really steal, right? 
And this is so important, right? We never saw a team winning without doing this, right? Uh, the reason is uh, usually you have a lot of services with a lot of vulnerabilities. There is no way you have enough manpower to just exploit all of them, right? You will always have one service that you didn't really look at, right? But if your tooling is good enough, you can just replicate exploits, you know, and steal. Uh, next up, if you cannot really steal exploits, you have to find them yourself. Uh, annoying, I know, very boring. Uh, but uh, again, it is necessary to win. Uh, focusing on attack is usually more important than focusing on defense. It depends on the ID, how the scoring is, but in general, uh, attack points are worth more. If you manage to exploit every single other team, this is more important than defense. Uh, there are a few uh, important things to keep in mind when uh, trying to find exploits. Um, the most important one is uh, there are more than one vulnerability per service. And uh, the difficulty is not the same. Very often you have low-hanging fruits and you should absolutely focus on them. Do not look for the cool exploits. Look for <laughs> Sorry, look for the easy ones. Look for the fastest you can implement. Do not worry about uh, the elegance or uh, how fascinating uh, one exploit is. Just get the flag as fast as possible. Uh, also, keep in mind, the last point is very important. Uh, whoever organizes the CTF uh, will maybe plant five bugs uh, in the service, um, but in truth, there will be 15, probably. Right? And the unintended ones are usually the best because they are the stupidest. And so keep an eye out for them. Then, uh, number four uh, is coordination. Uh, uh, team sizes nowadays are large. And uh, managing a team of hackers is not easy. Like, um, what you want is that uh, the, the, the main problem in AD is tunnel vision, right? People will focus on a service, try to write an exploit, and uh, do not really be aware of the main status of the game. Where are we being exploited? What do we need to patch? It's very important that you need at least one person that acts like an overseer, right? Looks at the scoreboard, looks at the traffic, and doesn't do anything else, and just tells people, okay, now you stop doing whatever you're doing and uh, replicate this exploit or patch this service. Even more important is infra people. By infra, we mean tooling, right? You need at least two people, possibly more, that are able to fix whatever breaks your tooling. Uh, this happens Every single time, we never had a CTF where our tooling didn't break for some super weird ex esoteric reason. And you want people that are very familiar with the tooling, possibly the developers of the tools itself, that can hot patch them as fast as possible, because if your tools go down, uh, basically you, your team also goes down. Then next up is defense, right? And uh, here you need to patch services uh, and uh, patch the bugs. Here it's very important that you forget everything you know about uh, good software practices or root cause analysis or whatever. Your priority here is to make the exploits stop working, right? The fastest you are, the better it is. So for example, you notice that uh, some team is exploiting a use after free, whatever, right? And instead of doing um, what is the weird condition that enables this use after free Something that works is maybe just modify the heap layout a bit. Just add a few mallocs here and there, right? This will actually break the exploit and you're good. For a few ticks, you don't care, right? Um, a, a good technique is to use uh, your own checker because uh, uh, your patches might break uh, SLA, service level agreement. So it's kind of important that you are aware that whatever you're doing doesn't break the intended functionality, right? Uh, next up, if you really cannot patch services, you can uh, at least harden them. Uh, this depends on the setup of the AD. Uh, some CTFs gives you more freedom on the wound box. For example, uh, DEFCON usually does not, but some, some other, they give you root on the wound box. And you can do all kinds of shenanigans to break exploits, right? For example, you can recompile your services with other sanitizers. So you prevent memory corruption trivially, right? You can, for example, remove BNSH. This works very well. I don't recommend to do it <laughs> because half of the binaries in your system will stop working. 
but it's a technique. You can go for defensive stuff, second, Selinux, apart more, whatever. Uh, something extremely unfair is checker detection. You might be able to determine when the checker is using your service compared to other teams, right? You cannot determine it from the IP, but maybe there is some peculiar characteristic in the request it does, right? Um, so what you do is you can clone the service and uh, serve to other teams uh, a clone service with fake flags, for example, flags you just randomize, right? This works, it works extremely well because the other teams cannot do anything about it. It's very unfair, but when you pull it off, it's amazing. <laughs> um, then uh, vectors, right? When you exploit a service, uh, you don't want the other team to patch it right away, right? And this really depends, again, on the ID. Do you have root or not? Can you pop a shell or not? But sometimes you can actually plant vectors and uh, steal flags for every tick, even after the service is patched. Uh, those are one of the best techniques if you can pull it off. Pay attention on make, make your vector hidden. Uh, pay attention that other teams do not traverse your vector and use the vector you planted on other teams. This also happens. Uh, in fact, very linked to this point is uh, masking your exploits. So when you have an exploit, especially if it's a trivial one, if it's an easy one, uh, you want to prevent the teams you are attacking to uh, trivially patch it or steal, steal it, right? So, uh, for example, one uh, very common technique is to encrypt the flag before you send it to, to yourself, right? As soon as you read it, you encrypt it with an RSA key or whatever, so it doesn't appear immediately in the traffic analyzer of whoever you're exploiting, and the other teams cannot reflect it because they need to change the key you're using to encrypt it, so they are going to waste time reversing whatever you're doing to hide your exploit and so on and so on, and this works pretty well. You can waste even one or two hours on another team if you prepare the encryption beforehand. Uh, lastly, if you're really out of ideas on what to do during uh, an attack defense, some teams uh, think that uh, this uh, Zavali strategy uh, submit garbage, garbage to other teams. Submit something that looks like it's throwing out a flag when it's not. And uh, you will waste time of whoever is analyzing the traffic. Uh, I was victim of this many times. It's very annoying. And, uh, but yeah, this is only if you have nothing else to do. Uh, finally, uh, one last thing that can have a slight advantage is to anonymize yourself. Do not make other players aware of who you are. Uh, this usually might be because uh, you might have beefs against other teams, you might be targeted, and so on and so on. So maybe you can play with a different name or whatever. Uh, but yeah, not super important. This was the last tip. Uh, we're now going to go inside uh, DEF CON specific strategies, right? Why? Because DEF CON is a very peculiar attack defense. Uh, it's played in a very weird location in Las Vegas, and this spawns a set of new problems that you will not have in a normal AD. For example, the location of where you play, right? Um, Team sizes are large, as I said. Last year we were 30. This year we merged with uh, Sour Cloud to play DEF CON. And we were about 50 playing the, the attack defense part, right? Uh, in Las Vegas, there are no uh, office rooms you can rent. There's no conference rooms with tables. Uh, there are only hotels. Uh, and in fact, uh, you need to rent a suite. This is what every team does. A very expensive suite. Um, there and you're going to need to play on beds and couches. And you just need to get creative. Uh, um, for example, here you can see our, <laughs> this is our closet battle station. Also, the, the location is split in two, uh, because eight of your players will play on the CTF floor, uh, you can see there, uh, in which all the teams have a table with eight players in them, and you get access to the game network with one Ethernet cable that comes out of this table. right? So your VPN setup needs to uh, support that the players in your suite will send all the traffic through the CTF floor, which goes through this Ethernet cable, and so on and so on. And it quickly becomes a huge mess. In fact, make sure, if you ever go there, uh, bring a shit ton of networking equipment, because it's uh, always a mess. Uh, another problem is the internet. Uh, 
mm, hotels do not give you good internet, here you need to get creative too, right? Each team has this problem every year. There is no good solution. Two years ago, we bought 10 teams with unlimited data, and uh, we had uh, a very weird setup of uh, uh, a router that multiplexed connections in, uh, with three phones. The phones were stored in, uh, um, in our bathroom. So for some weird reason, we tried many suites. Uh, a tip we can recommend, do not take a suite on a very high floor, because cell phone re reception is worse there. And uh, in all the suites we tried, for some reason, the bathroom had the best reception. I don't know why. And so basically, it turns out that, uh, like in, in the camp here, the, the, the toilets are the routers, actually. Uh, last year, we had a quote-unquote smart fridge. And uh, you know where this is going, so. Uh, I had a slide for this year. I had to, uh, I had to censor it because uh, unfortunately this will go public and we don't want to get banned from the hotel. But we can have this discussion offline of what happened this year. <laughs> and uh, yeah, finally, uh, a few things about DEF CON. Infra is very often down. The, the organizers' infra, not actually ours. Uh, the network is terrible most of the time. They're the only category is pawn. You might get baited into. Crypto, Rev, no, it's only pawn. In fact, your laptop will look like this after DEF CON. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, in conclusion, key takeaways uh, we want you to remember. Attack defense are very messy, very dirty, right? But they're also super fun. They're super stressful. The adrenaline you get when you replicate an exploit is, um, is very fun. Uh, tooling is what really makes a difference. If you want to get first place, you need to have the best traffic analyzer. Uh, there is no other option. And uh, lastly, yeah, uh, somehow uh, the, one of the best CTFs is hosted in the worst place. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, uh, NSpace, NC, and Pencil for your great talk. And yeah, give him another round of applause.